Welcome to episode 119 of the Rock and Roll Research Podcast, where we share the super cool backstories and side gigs of the research and insights pros that you trust. Well, hey, I am crazy excited about today's guest. He definitely is a researcher that many of you uh, have trusted over the years. His name is Eddie Accomando, and Eddie and I, hey, Eddie, um, fun story. Uh, so Quirks was in Dallas this year in February. At the end of Quirks, the Insights Association had a happy hour uh, that was held at the brand new gleaming uh, focus group facility of Fieldwork here in Dallas. It was really fun. I was uh, I was emceeing that uh, part of it anyway. Uh, Fieldwork was amazing to me. They made this great rock and roll research podcast birthday cake because it was my birthday too. After I said a few words, Eddie comes up. He's like, oh, man, we've got so much in common. We got to talk. Sure enough, we did talk <laughs> and we've become good friends. Matter of fact, we played a gig together. What was it last week? The week before? Right. There? Yeah. <laughs> More than friends. We're, we're kind of bandmates now, which is <laughs> <double> cool. <laughs> so so let me tell you a little something about Eddie. Eddie is a super pro market researcher. We've had uh, some chats over lunch about uh, theory and practice and all that good stuff. Uh, he's had some great gigs on the client side. He spent years at Verizon and Texas Instruments and others. Um, also the supplier side. He's been a uh, customer experience and experience management consultant at Qualtrics. Lots of good stuff. But uh, as I alluded to, Eddie has a band actually. It's called Honey Button right there honeybutton.com really amazing kind of uh americana focused stuff with a with a nice dose of rockabilly and blues does that sound about right that's pretty much it <laughs> okay. to... there we go okay we got it uh he does other things he he hosts open mics here in dallas uh he's actually got a radio show on a local uh k-n-o-n radio program which is really cool so all sorts of good stuff we'll get into it welcome to the show eddie Thanks, Matt. Seems like what I've known you for th three months, and we've got a, a lot of uh, ground to cover already. Uh, Matt said that I said, "Oh, we have a lot of in common. We should hang out." That's not exactly how it went. I made a beeline to him, and I told him how jealous I was of him because he's <laughs> he's doing everything I want to do, but better. You know, yeah had his podcast he was you know everybody was you know into his birthday he was a musician and you know doing market research he's a paisano so i was like oh man what are you talking about how can this happen to me it was funny and uh you know really great to meet you this year matt and uh it's super fun to play with you you're a yeah. good guy and a great friend i can tell already so uh, you know, much gratitude to you. And I'm sure the other uh, 118 uh, participants of your uh, podcast are also very grateful to you too. It's a cool thing you do for both the research and the music community to do this kind of thing. And it's a cool labor of love that you do. So thanks for having me. Cool. I appreciate the, appreciate the kind words, Eddie. Um, yeah. I, have to, I have to pause for a quick commercial break. If you listen to the podcast recently, you know, I've been taking this performance enhancement shot called Magic Mind. All sorts of good ingredients. My doctor said so. Uh, gives me some nice energy, clarity of mind, all that good stuff. So I'm going to go down the hatch. Get some ah. later. I'll do a soda now. Yeah, so check it out. Mm -hmm. Magicmind.com uh, backslash rock and roll. Use the code rock and roll 20 for a nice discount if you're interested in this kind of thing. So, all right. So let's get started, Eddie. Uh, I always like to start. Talking research, man. Talking shops. So, yeah. Uh, so let's hear about how you first got into research and a little bit about your journey. Wow. Well, uh, you know, I was raised by educators and I planned on being an educator. Uh, majored in a lot of arcane subjects. Yeah. So, uh, philosophy, uh, ancient history, uh, fiction literature uh theater mm -hmm. and it went to do anthropology 
and was in a PhD program at SMU. Okay. And in that program, you do three years and then you uh, start the process of doing field work and getting your PhD. So you do all your PhD coursework first and, and then they confer a master's on you and then you go on, you defend your thesis and then you go do the work. Well, when I got to that three year point, a lot of research methods, right? I mean, it's PhD level, level qual and quant research methods. Um, but I didn't want to go squirrel my stuff away in some academic journal somewhere. I wanted to get to work. And uh, market research seemed like the best place to use the knowledge I had in statistics, the qualitative chops we build as anthropologists. Sure. And so I remember being in my little apartment in South Dallas, just uh, we were filling out uh, resumes by hand at that time, you know, sending them in with the manila envelopes. And yeah, uh, you know, the the, the uh, real famous public opinion uh, places that were around. And when I graduated, sent all those out, ended up getting a job at a small firm called Service Strategies. And then everything took off from there. Yeah, yeah, cool. And, you know, there's. In, in talking to you, and we really did kind of get into it, um, talking about research, it was a real joy, a breath of fresh air to talk to you because, uh, you know, I can really tell, and I think it's a little bit of a lost, uh, maybe not a lost art, but it felt like early days in research, um, there were a lot of people that, even though people fall into research, they have this really strong uh, academic underpinning of what they've learned. And that came across instantly in talking with you. Um, and yep. so it made it a really good discussion. Um, it feels like sometimes those discussions are few and far between. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's certainly, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that's you know, kind of built your foundation, it sounds like. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, it's the reason why I do it. It's the, uh, the intellectual hunt, you know, as a yeah. learner and a teacher. That's for me what it's all about. I have another friend from Minnesota. I'm not going to use his name, but maybe in the comments of the podcast, he might reveal himself. He's another Minnesotan. Another He's, Minnesotan. Uh, yeah, I call full, him the- Full disclosure, uh, I think I'm the first Minnesotan. The, the one the first, that, yeah. You're the only Minnesotan, really, right? <laughs> but, uh, that's the comparison, right? Okay. That's, cool. that's the other thing. You know, I'm <laughs> Texan, fiercely proud of being a Texan. Like, you can't not be- it's like programmed into us at a very early age. <laughs> That's clear. The only state in the union. But I do know so many people from Minnesota. The, the culture, the people are just real, authentic people that I just love to get along with. Anyway, this guy said um, pretty recently as we're looking at the vista of what is research about, maybe we'll get to this. He said, we've entered the period of good is good enough research. Yeah. Yeah, well, we have a lot of people that are coming in. They're writing a writing a survey. Maybe they are not using any technique. They're not trying to do anything a certain way. It's just get it out, get it done, get it over with. And so I think that's kind of one of the things that uh, being a, kind of an original like academic researcher when academic researchers were the norm in in research it's been an interesting ride so that mr toad's wild ride in terms of what we bring to our discipline yeah yeah absolutely cool all right so let's so let's talk music a little bit um you clearly have the, here's what here's how i would say it um you're it feels like you're a great songwriter first i mean the songs you've written on this honey button cd i gotta say are excellent uh, I was able to learn them real quickly, and it was a true joy to back your back your music uh, at the Craft and Growler here in Dallas. Yeah. Um, and so the songwriting really comes through. You're obviously also a very uh, competent guitar player, a good vocalist, all that kind of stuff. How did that all start for you? Well, you know, it's a lot of the theater background. It's a lot of uh, my dad having an album collection that... Uh, he let me dig into starting at four huh. and five, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, what, what, and were some, was, what were some of your favorites? Yeah. Dad was pretty cerebral. So we were watching, we were listening to uh moody blues, Uriah heap, uh, <laughs> yeah. miles Davis. Wow. Uh, bunch of, yeah. Yeah. He was pretty, very eclectic, had some really just great stuff. Um, get three dog night because he was a hippie you know so there was all this uh 
just getting into those albums and and really um wondering how how they broke apart how were they made why do they make me feel this way how is the art related to the music uh what are the things saying and so yeah. obviously very verbal person very uh performance based so yeah songwriting comes first for me uh my voice comes second and i would say that's right i'm a competent guitarist that's why i'm glad i've got hector bob and heath bracket to come in and uh you know really punch up some leads for me i love to do lead guitar i mean i like it a lot but as you can tell i'm just very you know my shirt says three chords and the truth for a reason (laughs) you know what's what's kind of funny here here's kind of an interesting angle on this so uh for me it was also uh, you know rush was the first band i really fell deeply in love with uh, and as you know, it's really complex, complicated stuff. And what I really loved was the fact that they had these concept albums, right? Start to yeah. finish every song played into this concept. Now you've got this great, really interesting yeah. thing with Honey Button that you would never associate uh, like a big macro concept with something like Americana. Okay. But you've done this with Honey Button. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, let me try to. I know you got a lot of questions to go to, so I'm gonna try to try to be as as efficient as possible. Look, you know, I saw Rush eight times, and uh, one of my favorite bands ever. You know, twenty one twelve would be one of those you know top ten albums for sure. Um, but a lot of it is about uh, uh, writing a novel, creating an experience. Right. Basically, Colonel Honeybutton isn't just a band; he's a character. Right. And uh, he has uh, the, the quickest way to say it is he has a like a spatiotemporal dementia and <laughs> uh, lives his life from 1846 to 2150. Right. Uh, and there's uh, a plausible explanation for that in the book. So a little bit of historical fiction in it as well. So yeah. um, it's supposed to do that. Uh, I guess the point with the art is let's look at the the relationship between history, modernity, and post-modernity. If you could live three lifetimes and be young, middle-aged, and old, what would that look like? How would you feel? What is our relationship with everything? And so, yeah, this CD, old technology already. Like, people don't have CD players. So (laughs) it's the first media. I'm doing a second one that's a vinyl that's in the middle, modernity, and then I'm doing a third one. It's going to be based on a lot of the files that I'm using in the first two. Uh, and it's a USB stick. Ah, oh, I see. So, so the format also plays into the theme, which is kind of cool. Yeah, and I think now I have to do a thousand Instagram reels uh, to try to, to get it out. To the <laughs> That's right. It's actually hard to keep up. <laughs> cool. All right. So, so when when was that? When did music the music bug really hit you? Was this like a high school thing, or later on, or like when you started playing and and writing? Oh, no, I got my first uh, uh, classical guitar from a kid who was teaching me. He was in high school, uh, Camp Brumley, and he uh, gave me this K guitar. It was just a regular, you know, classical guitar with nylon strings. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think it was supposed to be my guitar. (laughs) I think he he was lending it to me so I could play. (laughs) Uh, well, it's end up being, being like Trigger. It's it's my guitar. I got stickers all over my guitars. And that was the first one I put stickers on. I think at some point he just released control of the guitar <laughs> to me uh, because I was really into it. And I really enjoyed uh, playing it. And of course, the great big strings of a classical guitar when you have 12 year old hands was good for my hands, you know. And so, yeah, it does still doesn't have a pickup in it. You know, it just is what it is. And, you know. Now, is there is there something to be so you've you've been active in these two spheres you're pretty much your whole life um is there are, are these two separate spheres here's my professional career around research and insights here's my music career never the twain shall meet or is there something to be learned from one that can be applied to the other yeah, both and there, you know, being a design thinking person and that yeah. kind of thing, I would say both and, but kind of a surprising journey just in knowing you. 
so yeah, always very separate. You know, Anthro Consulting is my, uh, you know, how I, I, the shingle I put out for market research. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody cares that I'm a musician there. Uh, Colonel mm -hmm. Honeybutton does his music things. And I don't think anybody cares whether I do market research there. So I've always kept them very, very separate, very yeah. kind of dichotomous experience. But then when you were coming for the gig and we were trying to get people to go, you went out to LinkedIn and you just said, look, you know, this guy does both things. Yeah. And I was thinking, and then, you know, as we're preparing for this podcast, you're talking about what are the similarities between uh, music and market research. A lot of bells like start ringing, you know, it's yeah. the attention to detail, right? It's the sure. uh, organizing uh, small things for bigger concepts. It's the collaborative or team element. You know, when you look at a band, that's your AE, your quant jockey, your focus group guy, your program manager. You know, there's a lot. Totally. Of, you know, we don't get there ourselves. Um, you know, clients, you know, different people that might like, Maybe that's not their cup of tea. You know, how do you how do you present something that's a that's a truth in a way that the genre, the presentation uh, will land with a broad audience? There's a lot of similarities there. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the part what makes us good market researchers, what makes us good musicians, good artists, good people, really, uh, is the ability to vacillate back and forth between digging into the details and doing the hard work, what I call eating your vegetables, getting that banner together, running that cross tab, you know, looking, you know, making sure your assumptions are correct statistically, um, figuring out whether you're doing it pairwise or stepwise and why. And then over here, what's the big point? Why are you doing that? What are you regressing against? What variable? Why am I putting this, uh, run here why am i using an accordion what's the point with a with a harmonica here what production yeah. element am i trying to develop there uh because the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts but the parts sure. themselves are very important and so i think that's like the major hook between the two things yeah i love that i love that i can i can certainly uh, i can certainly relate to to what you're saying there um so let's let's talk a little bit more research again um, you know, I think that we all realize that the, the industry is changing, you know, how research gets done and it's, people are changing, media is changing, all that good stuff, right? Um, curious to know, as you kind of look out to, uh, the future of research, uh, I'll let you choose your time horizon, but what, what do you see, uh, as you, as you look forward? Let's not burn through technology again. Let's not just rip a path through AI and use it indiscriminately. Okay, yeah. what I've seen in my career is that we went from really being uh, deeply qualitative, I'm talking about Alan Lomax on the music side, Franz Boaz on the anthropology side, uh, you know, really getting a qualitative uh, deep psychoanalysis, right? Um, the, you know, the origins of focus groups being in people's houses, that kind of thing, right. to paper surveys we must yeah. do that really quick then we started calling people at dinner i remember my kid my uh, sisters and i would uh rush to answer the survey on the phone when they called us <laughs> yeah you know? it was exciting we'll yeah. burn through phone surveys you can't do that anymore now yeah. email good luck getting caught yeah. in a spam filter you know working for software companies see us all the time yeah. It's, it's yeah. now we've gone through not only is it digital but now people want to do it as a side industry just straight line through a survey and make your two dollars and straight line through the next survey you know yeah. two panels we got people involved in panels and now we don't contact them we don't curate our panels we don't give them a reason to stick around text messaging i mean great stuff going on andrew reed's got rival going on out there it's like conversational it's good good software companies are learning how to change that method of being right. able to get people text i ignore them i get rid of them you know at somebody you over text people so what are we going to do in the realm of ai that's just going to churn through that technology really quick in a way it's yeah. great that we have all these technologies but we are like 
I don't know, locusts or something. When we get a new technology, <laughs> we, we go in and we just eat it up. And so you're always looking at another way to get that truth out of people. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I mean, it is sort of a shame because you think, oh, new technology, this is the way it's going to be. You don't yeah. realize that the time horizon is going to be extremely short because <laughs> we just beat it up and, uh, yeah. you know, we're like moths, you know, chewing holes in the fabric. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. AI has a great point. It, it's it's going to help market research. There's things we can do with it, but just assuming that you know, it's kind of like when I got my first Commodore 64. Of course, Dad was big on that, so maybe I'm I'm aging myself a little bit. But Commodore 64 <laughs> was like the thing because you had to get into computers, right? <laughs> yeah. And now I think there's a lot of get into AI. Yeah. You know, you just got to okay. know about the AI machines. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> you, you got to be more thoughtful. You got to be more careful. You got to look at what is it that chat GPD is doing? How are you doing it? What yeah. are you revealing? What is it revealing? You know, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, cool. Couldn't agree more. All right. So, uh, so hey, this is a podcast, right? It's media. Interested to know, Colonel Honeybutton, Eddie, <laughs> what media are you turning to for Big broad question: Insights, inspiration, or enjoyment? What's oh, taking up your time? It's another one. I've got a shortcut. You know, I don't <laughs> I have a wife. I'm not domesticated. I don't have kids, so it's all about <laughs> media for me. Yeah. It, uh, look, books. Uh, I read CX methodology books, philosophy, history, fiction. Uh, Catcher in the Rye and Hitchhiker's Guide. I read once a year. You know, there's <laughs> yeah. all these kind of things that I just do. Uh, you know, I write. And so that's another way. So there's this literary function, that kind of media, the like British sitcoms, man. I'm working through Red Dwarf for the eighth time, you know, uh, Monty <laughs> nice. Python, kids in the hall. Uh, you know, if it's a goofy kind of intellectually headed comedy troupe, like I'm in. And yeah. that's sort of like, you know, where, you know, people would watch like reality TV or something. That's kind of my thing. Yeah. Let's watch news radio back to back again, you know, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, inspiration, you know, for me uh, is all about finding new music. Just if I could turn the camera around, you'd see the vinyl around here. Uh, We're looking at the book side, not the vinyl side. Right? Yeah, you are. This is the book <laughs> corner. This is the anthropology <laughs> corner stuck in here, but. Uh, yeah, buying vinyl sight unseen, going through, looking at, trying to find something I don't know about. Look, I mean, that happens yeah. digitally and on CDs and all at that too. But I love being surprised by by new music. I know finding relationships in bands that you didn't know existed, uh, you know, uh, cool uh, points and poetry and songs. And, you know, the stuff that makes you cry. That's what I'm after. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah. inspires me. Yeah. Totally. Um, yeah, just another thing we have in common. I just love the idea of wow, this album looks really cool. I'm gonna buy it. I can't wait to get home to discover uh, you know, what's what's on this record, right? It's mm -hmm. always been one of my greatest thrills. So cool. Cool. All right. All right, Eddie. So speaking of music, you know, this is a question. It's a question we finish every podcast episode with. I kind of know. I mean, I don't even know where to start, like in terms of what I would forecast for the for your answer on this. But let's say you're stranded on a desert island, right, Eddie? You've got three albums of your choosing to keep you company for the rest of your days. What are they? Man, I'm going to be the worst respondent for this question. Number one, <laughs> three albums. Are you kidding me? Three <laughs> albums? I wouldn't. That's the way it is, man. I wouldn't. You give me three albums. First thing I'm saying is, where's the turntable? <laughs> All right. You didn't promise me a turntable. So maybe I'll just get the ones with the greatest graphics on them. I don't know. Uh, three albums. I'd say, okay, let me go get them. And then I would find the biggest double albums and I would cram in there 2112 by Rush, uh, Redheaded Stranger, or Shotgun Willie, uh, yeah. Graceland. Uh, yeah. Remain in Light by the Talking Heads, uh, Kind of Blue by Miles Davis, Are You Experienced with Hendrix, <laughs> Wu-Tang Clan, 36 Chambers, Up from the 36 Chambers, right? <laughs> Tapestry by Carol King. We do uh, London Calling, 
by The Clash. I do Rumors by Fleetwood Mac. Dark Side of the Moon by uh, Pink Floyd. Uh, Asia, Steely Dan. Yeah. Stevie Wonder, awesome. you know. Uh, yeah. In, in Songs in the Key of Life. Uh, no Depression by Uncle Tupelo. You know, that's one of the big ones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Camper Van Beethoven, Our Beloved Revolutionary oh, Sweetheart. Yeah. Right and then I would pack all those up in three album covers. And I'd say, <laughs> I got my three, Matt. Let's go. And give me a volleyball. I'll paint a paint a face on it. <laughs> all right. I'm going to let you get away with that. Just because I'm like, God. Somehow I knew you'd let me because, yeah. <laughs> this is the hardest question to ask of researchers usually. It's like, yeah. they, they've got to think of, they start thinking about, okay, yeah. this is how you framed it. Um, so here's how I'm going to get around it and cheat. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, most of us are pretty obedient, so we know we're being disobedient about the question. But, but come on, three albums. <laughs> I'm already right. going to have sunburn and trying to open a coconut and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, have me listen to like only Dark Side of the Moon <laughs> all day long. All right, I'm gonna let you slip that whole that whole mess in. Okay. <laughs> so, all right, all right, Eddie. Hey, man, this is. Uh, I'm so glad we met. Um, it's just been a I joke hanging that. out with you, man. So, <laughs> totally, oh, totally. So, yeah, what thanks. A fun thing. Thanks to Fieldwork for putting together that really crazy fun uh, happy hours. One of my favorites ever. So it was my I'm favorite. Like, I want to say that. Yeah. So, I mean, I love it. I love an event like that where, and it's qualitative research at its, at its roots, right? Yeah. Get people comfortable. You can't lie to me when you're eating a chocolate chip cookie and you're having <laughs> fun and everybody was having just a gas and, you know, it had been a great conference. You know, you got to give it up for quirks. They oh, put on a very fun, very cool conference there, but you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, kismet, happens so good to meet you and you guys got a real you know oh it was fun to play backbeat for eddie are you kidding me you're <laughs> such a good drummer man you made the whole gig like so easy i mean you're the spine of the band there you're kind of keeping everything together everybody was just super amazed and you know first time we played we hadn't rehearsed we hadn't done anything but you know sure. there's that thing that bandmates have you know that you know where i'm going i know where you're yeah. going it was just super fun. And thanks so much for having me on the podcast. And just thanks for being you, man. Hey, hey, absolutely. Absolutely. Likewise. So, so, hey, Eddie, if I don't see you sooner, it sounds like we might be playing again in August, huh? Yeah, so, maybe right. so. We yeah. got a, a August 24th date uh, at Craft and Growler. It's their 12th anniversary. So I think we're angling for that one. Yeah. Too. That'll be a longer set. We'll do uh, two sets there and we might even rehearse before that one. <laughs> Go figure. All right. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll keep everybody posted. Hey, Eddie, we'll definitely be talking soon. See you soon. Sure. Roll.